Father, bless us now as we minister the word of the Lord. Save the soul that's near as hell. Heal the sick that are in our midst. Mend the brokenhearted. Strengthen the weak. Open the eyes of the blind. Be glorified, O oh God, in our midst today. May the word of the Lord sink deep in us and may we do no damage but preach that which is sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, touch me one more time. Or do it again, Lord. Uh, now, I really like do it again even better, but you, you'll see why as we study the word of the Lord together today. The Lord on July the 4th, after visiting my mother, and as I forementioned earlier, it was the best 4th of July um, ever. And it wasn't the best because of fireworks. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a pyrotechnics person. I mean, I like to see the professionals, but I, I don't play with firecrackers, you know. I, I don't think I've done anything like that since I was 12. Uh, uh, the Bible says when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I believed like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things, and I'm not going to be holding anything that can blow up in my hand, blow all my fingers off just to get a laugh. Amen. So, um, and, and, but I, I'm, I'm pre- I'm presupposed, I'm, um, it's easy for me to enjoy July the 4th celebrations because I am a proud American. Amen. Uh, before I am a hyphenated American, I'm an American. I'll never forget one day I was speaking to a quorum of lawyers and judges and um, I learned later that I was the first minister of any color to be invited to speak to these lawyers and judges. And I was introduced to them as a African-American minister. And I said to them, I, if I am a, an African-American minister, then if you're going to hyphenate me, let's hyphenate everybody. So we've got some Irish-Americans in here some British Americans, so forth and so on. And I said to them, I'm an American. I, I happen to be of African descent, but I was born here. I love this nation. Well, America has problems. Well, I love you. You have problems. I have problems. Uh, a person doesn't have to be perfect. A place doesn't have to be perfect for you to love it. I say, well, what about our history, the history of slavery? Well, my question is, what about it? Well, uh, we had slavery, yes, and we ended it. We ended it. So, well, some of the Christians owned slaves, but, but all of the abolitionists who ended slavery were Christians. And they were motivated by Christianity. See, it's not fair to highlight a negative. Now, it's, it's wrong to pretend that it didn't exist, but it's not fair to highlight a negative as though the thing still, is still taking place. We ended slavery. Let me tell you, the blood, more Americans died to end slavery than Americans died to end any war on earth. The only war where we lost more casualties than the Revolutionary War is the war on the unborn. That's the only war 
that have taken more American lives than the Civil War. On both sides, black and white, freedmen and slaves died to bring to a close what is called America's original sin. And uh, we who are the descendants of those slaves, you have to admit, for all who have desired to do so and were willing to overcome obstacles and work hard and do whatever was necessary, we've come a long way. And you shouldn't let anybody tell you that you have it. You can't, you can't go down and drive up in your corporate job and say nothing has changed. You can't go to your air-conditioned houses, praise the Lord, driving in your air-conditioned car. Walk into any restaurant you can afford to walk in and sit down and be served by the descendants, in many cases, of slave owners and say nothing has changed. You can't do that. You can't do that. The Lord is blessing us. We're in one of the strongest economies ever. Somebody said, oh, they'd be yeah, but... Some people are having to work two and three jobs to make ends meet. That accounts for 5% of the working public. 5% are working two jobs or more to make ends meet. Most people are, are being blessed to make ends meet and to thrive with one job. Amen. And you, I tell you what, uh, say we're, we're struggling, we can't make it. Had nobody told the malls. Nobody has, has spoken to uh, the vacation destination places. Wherever you go, there we are, struggling. <laughs> oh, my, up there in the presidential suite, struggling. We can't, can, we can't make it. Amen. But what made that day special, let me get back to this, is because I spent the day with my mother. And um, um, me and Gabriel, and Tom, and his wife Sherry, uh, uh, we just, we, we, we had a ball. And after the visit, I was driving home. I had my wife in the car with me, and my wife had been down with me earlier to see my mother, but at that time, she was at her aunt's because her mom, and we've been praying for her, and thank God, she's home now. My wife's mother went into the hospital, and God touched that pretty lady and raised her up, and she's home, and we celebrate that. It was, it was quite a week last week. And um, we stick together. We pray for each other. We do what we have to do. We've learned to be force multipliers. We can quickly make two of us work like it's four or six or eight. Whatever has to be done, we make it happen by the grace of the Almighty. And it touched me to see my wife's mother um, better. Praise the Lord. God is good. He's a mighty good God. A true God. And an everlasting king. Amen. And so she was there. And uh, so we're all in the car. Had the grandchildren, they're such a joy. And while driving back, everybody had dozed off. The Lord placed this passage on my mind. Amen. Praise the Lord. This story came to my heart. And uh, Prophet Dave, you know what it's like. I couldn't shake it. So I knew it's got to be God. And this is what he wants me to preach. 
Saints, I don't know from Sunday to Sunday what I'm going to preach. It's not my job to know. It's my job to listen. God knows. Amen. And uh, so he put this on my heart. And this particular story in Scripture is told, this particular one, only in the book of Mark. All right? While it is true that during Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus healed in the gospel. There is an account of Jesus healing at least seven blind men during his earthly ministry. And uh, I say at least seven because there were times when he literally healed multitudes of people. And there were blind people uh, among those crowds. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 29 through 31 says, And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, Blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb speak, and the maimed to be whole, and the lame to walk, and the blind to see. When they saw it, they glorified the God of Israel. That's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 29 through 31. Luke's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse 21 says, And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Amen. Jesus was called, Luke tells us, to give, among other things, to preach the gospel to the poor, but also to give sight to the blind. He opened blinded eyes. So there's no telling. We can't, we can't put a number on the number, uh, uh, on the, uh, we can't give a number uh, to the, the blind people that Jesus gave sight to. So, among the things that makes this text unique is, uh, and that makes this healing unique is that it was not an instantaneous healing. Follow me on this. This healing occurred gradually. This reminds me of what Jesus said to his disciples in the Great Commission after his resurrection and just before his ascension, among other things, Jesus said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 18, the last clause, Jesus says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Recover comes from Two Greek words, when combined, literally means to hold or to take possession of good. Amen. To get your good, G-O-O-D, back. We would lay hands on the sick and they would get their good back. And the good, in this case, was health. And we've seen God. Hallelujah. We prayed and seen sick people recover. We've seen miracles of healings, which are instantaneous. But we've seen people over time, praise the Lord, recover. We're watching Sister Roberts recover. I looked at her today. I said, I can tell you're doing better. Praise the Lord. She's fairer. She's fatter. God is blessing her. There's a recovery going on. Amen. I believe in God to bless my mother 
to recover. Andre Barrios' mama is in recovery. Praise the Lord. They're getting their good back. Praise the Lord. And thank God that God blesses us to recover in other areas. When you remember at Ziklag, David asked the Lord, says, shall I pursue? And the Lord said, you shall pursue. And then says, and you shall recover all. Well, the Bible is something, isn't it? Amen. So uh, in our text, this was not an a instantaneous healing. The cure or the miracle was not an instantaneous one, but the man recovered. Now, before I go further, bear with me just a few minutes. I want to say something that we all need to understand about the Bible and about the God of the Bible and about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you got to hear this the right way or you'll miss what I'm saying and you'll leave uh, devoid of understanding and you try, may try to explain it to somebody and you'll explain it the wrong way. Let me tell you this. The Bible tells us all that we need to know about the God of the Bible. Everything you need to know about the God of the Bible, the Bible tells us. When it comes to serving him, when it comes to how to get to heaven, when it comes to how to live here on this earth, when it comes to how to touch him, how to worship him, amen, how to please him, the Bible tells us all of these things. But the Bible does not tell us all that is to be known about God. It simply tells us all we need to know. But it doesn't tell us all that there is to be told about him. And the Bible tells us that it doesn't tell us all that is to be known about God. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 and 19 says, For the raft of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There are men who because of their own unrighteous deeds, they suppress the truth of God. Look at this. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. That is, what can be known about God is evident among them. It didn't say all that there is to know about God is evident, but that which may be known. He, let us, he lets us know all that we need to know about him. And all that we need to know about him, he tells us in the scripture. That's one point I want you to get. Second point is this. The Bible tells us of the wonderful things that Jesus did when he walked this earth during his earthly ministry. But it doesn't tell us all that Jesus did when he walked the earth. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us this. In John's Gospel, chapter 21 and verse 25, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Isn't that amazing? He walked there for 33 years. He practiced his ministry for only three years. And yet, if they recorded everything that he did, the world itself could not contain the volumes that should be written when it comes to what Jesus did in just three years of ministry. What a mighty God we serve. Also, you find in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, it says, And many other signs 
truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John acknowledges that he had to be selective, choosing from the vast amount of material about Jesus. But he, but he put enough in there for us to believe. Glory to God. And that in believing we might have life through his name. But there is coming a day when we will know fully and we will understand perfectly. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. God knows new Paul. God knows new Paul like God knows all of us. He knows us completely. The Bible speaks of a day when we will know God just as God knows us. John said this in 1 John 3 and 2. says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Until then, we learn, we study, and we, ac we accept the scriptures as they are written. What is my point in this little excursion? What's the point, Bishop, in telling us that the Bible tells us that which may be known of God, but it doesn't tell us everything that there is to be known of God. Why, why point out that the scriptures, uh, is the, that the writers were selective with what they wrote about what Jesus did in just three years of ministry? Praise the Lord, since he did so much that the earth could not contain the volumes. What, what is the point of this? The point is, that when we read the Bible, we have to be careful when we try to answer questions that God doesn't answer. Or we try to speculate or we put inferences on things. If we bring conjecture in, we ought to argue conjecture as conjecture. If we speculate, we should argue speculation as speculation. Because we serve a God who is not... Um, he does not owe us to explain everything to us. He's not going to explain everything to you. Somebody came to that conclusion, and I heard them when they picked up the pen and wrote a song and said, we'll understand it better by and by. So we got to know how to deal with God and know that he's God, and we're not. And he will tell us, what we need to know. The Bible likens the word of God as a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. Now at the time when David wrote that, they didn't have flashlights. They didn't have lights on uh, 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 smartphones. They didn't have flood lamps that could shine way in the distance. They had candles. And the light only shined just one step ahead. And they knew darkness unlike us because we really don't know darkness. We have, to, we have to go through a lot of effort to get in darkness because there are street lights everywhere. Lights on the television, lights on this, lights on that. I, 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 I go through a routine trying to block all the lights in our bedroom so that when I go to sleep, I like to be in darkness and it's still hard to obtain complete darkness because Pam went and bought some phones that as soon as you put the phone on the charger, the thing lights up. So it's a green light. And I'm saying, Lord, I can't, you know, you just, you just can't get dark. You just... <laughs> yes, uh, uh, you, you sleep better in the dark. And it's better for you and, 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 and in a cool room. 
Praise God. Your body repairs itself better. It goes into deeper sleep and all that. Let, let me get back to this. I'm not a, 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 a medical doctor, but I, you know, maybe one day I'll play one on TV. So, now, again, this healing is different. Um, another difference is that it contains, for the only time that I've read in Scripture, a question concerning the healing. After Jesus had laid hands on the man and healed him, you know, when he told the man to take up his bed and walk, he said, take up your bed and walk. He never asked the man, can you walk? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Said to the man, uh, stretch forth thy hand. The man with the withered hand, stretch forth thy hand. The man stretched forth his hand. Jesus didn't say, uh, can you stretch forth your hand? He says, no, he said, stretch it forth. But after he laid hands on this man, he asked the man, can you see anything? Now, we know that our Lord is omnipotent. He knows everything. And yet he asks this question. Remember now, I'm, I'm telling you, the Bible tells us what we need to know. Praise the Lord. So we're going we're gonna to study the scriptures. Are you with me? You hanging in there with me? You hanging in there with me? Praise the Lord. Now let's look at our text and let's, let us ask the Lord to do it again for us. Now the Bible teaches that he cometh to Bethsaida. Now the word means the house of fish. And uh, this little village was on the northeastern shore of of the Sea of Galilee, amen, and, um, and actually, actually, uh, as the Jordan River entered into the Sea of Galilee, because you know, Jordan comes down, empties into the Sea of Galilee, and then from the Sea of Galilee goes down and empties into the Dead Sea. Am I right? At the top of the Sea of Galilee, in that region, that was Bethsaida, that was Chorazin, that was Capernaum, those cities. They were within 10 to 20 miles of each other. And this city was a city that was a, a headquarters of Jesus. Are you following me? So he's in Bethsaida. And th this city was also noted because it was the hometown of Philip, Andrew, and Peter. If you read John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 44, you see that it was their hometown. And Luke records Jesus, one of Jesus' previous visits to Bethsaida. Luke uh, 9 and 10 says, And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Sadia. While Jesus was there, the Bible says they, we're not told who they are, apparently the residents, bring a blind man unto him. I think it's safe to presume that they were friends of the blind man. They brought this blind man to Jesus. And when they brought him to Jesus, they didn't just bring him to Jesus, but they brought him to Jesus. They were, they were men on a mission. They brought him to Jesus, and if you study this, you see that the tone was quite vehement. They were matter of fact. It was uh, energetic. The Bible says they besought him that he would touch him. Otherwise, when they brought the man to Jesus... They, I'm not going to say that they were uh, impolite, but they were not sedate. Uh, it was kind of dynamic what was going on here. It wasn't static. These guys brought the man and said, touch him, touch him, Lord. You need to touch him. Touch him. Touch him. We brought him to you that you might touch him. Touch him. Are you with me? That is, apply yourself to him. Lay your hands on him, Jesus. Touch him. And I like what Butler said about their request because although their request was genuine, there was something wrong with it. That's why I said, I'm naming this message, touch me one more time, but I, I kind of like bless me one more time, a little better. For, for there was something 
slightly off center with their approach. And perhaps we've made the same mistake. I don't know. Uh, only time will tell. But the plea, although it was fervent, and although it was a good plea, I, I, I certainly would have wanted them to uh, uh, make this, that, this kind of plea for me. Uh, but for them to presume how Christ should heal the man wasn't good. See, they didn't say heal him. They said touch him. So what they meant heal him. No, they said touch him. Now what they wanted was for him to be healed. What, what, what's the point? They put more faith in the method than in the master. Because the truth is, the master don't have to touch you to heal you. See, see. Too many times we try to tell God how to do it. And we're not told, we're not given to tell God how. You, you can ask, you can, you can make your request and say, what? Lord, I want you to heal me. Lord, I want you to make me whole. God, I want you to save my child. God, I want you to fix this. But it is not given to us to tell the Lord how to do it. Because if we knew all that, we could just do it. See, there, they said, touch him. They, they presumed, Butler says, they presumed to dictate to Christ how to heal the man. Asking for healing is one thing, but dictating the method is another. Some of us only look for God in the mailbox. The Lord can bless you in more ways than sending a check through the mail. He knows how to get your blessing to you. God can send your blessing through a vagabond. God can send your blessing through a paper bag rolling on the ground. Don't limit the Lord. Amen. And telling him how, uh, tell him how to do it. Just ask him for what you want and keep your faith in the master. Some of you, you don't mean to harm, but when you come and I, I may say, now the Lord hadn't led me to lay hands on anyone. And, 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 but I'm going to pray in this. God's going to do it through this prayer. And we pray and we, di we dissipate. And everybody go back to that seat. There's always one or two who insist on a certain method. But we had already prayed the prayer. Now, I'll accommodate you. But you're putting more faith in the method than you are the master. Let God do it in any way that he chooses to do it. For he knows how to deliver. Praise the Lord. Don't try to tie his hands and tell him how to do it. Because sometimes the Lord will bless you in a conventional way. But then there are other times the Lord will bless you in an unconventional way. You don't see it coming. That's because in many cases it's not time yet. They tried to tell Jesus how to do it. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him, Lord. And you know what Jesus did? Uh, the Bible says in verse 23, and he took the blind man by the hand. He touched him. And guess what? The man was still blind. He touched him, grabbed him by the hand. Isn't that a touch? He touched him. He touched him. And, uh, and, uh, and then he touched him and uh, uh, grabbed him by the hand. And the Bible says that Jesus did something else uh, that uh, was, was different. It says, and led him out of time. Led him out out of time. Now, praise the Lord, he led him out of town. Do I have a praying church? Why did Jesus lead him out of town? 
Why this method? Why this unconventional way of dealing with this man? I, I hadn't read where Jesus uh, led somebody out of town to heal them before. The believer says this, our Lord is sovereign and is not obligated to account to us for his actions. There was a valid reason for everything he did. Even though we might not perceive it, every case of healing is different, as is every case of conversion. Some gain remarkable spiritual insight as soon as they are converted. Others see dimly at first, then later enter into full assurance of salvation. So he has a way, but he doesn't necessarily all the time explain the way. One man uh, opined and said that it could have been that it was an atmospheric problem. Remember, that was an atmospheric problem when Jesus uh, went to his hometown. He went to Nazareth. The Bible says in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 5 through 6, and he could not there do mighty works, say that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. So it could have been that the atmosphere in Beth Sadia was not conducive for healing. It could have been the spiritual condition of the blind man. That's what it could have been. His condition. So, uh, you know, that it could have been that Jesus said to him, walk with me. Feel my love. Feel my power. Let your faith grow. Because remember now, the blind man did not ask for healing. His friends brought him to Jesus. His friends did all the talking. I'd like to think, had it been me, I would have said something. Since I'm the one standing there blind. Everybody else saying, heal him, touch him, touch him, touch him. I would have joined in and said, touch me, Lord. Since the rare, everybody else was sighted, and yet this man said nothing. It could be that he didn't have faith to be healed. And Jesus needed to cozy up with him a little bit have walked with him for some reason not given. The man was not ready for instant healing. Are you praying for me? Yeah. Or perhaps this too was done for us. Perhaps Jesus grabbed him by the hand and took him out of town for us. Remember John 20 and 31, the A-Claw says, but these are written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Or as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, says, now all things, all these things happened unto them for examples that they were written for our admonition. So it could be that Jesus did this knowing that years later we would need healing and that the Lord would take us through a gradual process and the last uh, bit of speculation, uh, which, which might be uh, dead on it, is that the problem could be the problem wasn't the man, nor was it his friends. It could be the problem was the town. Because after he healed him, he told him not to go back in that town. And after he healed him, he told him not to tell anybody in the town that he had healed them. Why? What was the problem with the town? The town had a problem. And some of us have the same problem that the town had. Some of us are walking, talking, living, breathing Bethsaida's. We have the same problem. God had the same problem with us as he had with that town. The Bible says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, chapter 11 verse 20 through 21, then began he to upbraid the cities wherein his most mighty works were done because they repented not. And he said, and woe unto thee, to thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you 
had been done in Tyre and Zidon, they would have long ago repented in sackcloth and ashes. It could be that Jesus by this point was determined that he was not going to perform another miracle in the town of Bethsaida for he had performed many miracles and they still wouldn't get right. The Lord is not going to keep trying to prove to you that he's God. God is not going to keep trying to prove to me that he's God. He's not going to keep showing us mercy on top of mercy, making a way on top of a way, healing on top of healing, and what he gets back is still more unbelief, more disobedience, more dragging our feet. There come a time. There comes a time when you have to believe God. And the Lord says, I have shown you enough. That was my point last Sunday uh, with the sister Hurst. I've shown you enough. Don't you stand there and cry. I've shown you enough to, to believe me. Give me a chance. You've seen me heal the sick. You've seen me work miracles in your life. You've seen me touch your children. You've seen me raise you up. I'm preaching to you now. You've seen me turn things around. I've performed enough miracles for you to believe me. Isn't that what he said about Israel? He said, 40 years have I shown them. Praise the Lord. And God said, I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. For I had given them enough miracles. I had performed enough in their presence for them to believe me. Some of us have been saved too long to be so faithless. Some of us have been washed in the blood too long to have to believe God anew every trial. What do you mean, college student, going to college and backsliding after years of having invested in you, years of teaching you the scripture, years of telling you what God can do? What do you mean, grown man, in leaving your family? You come, you've come up in this church and you've been taught that marriage is right and that you're supposed to be responsible for your family and you're going to have to see in that God will bless you if you're responsible and you still leave you walk out and leave your wife and children what do you mean you've seen too much you've been exposed to too much to behave in such a childish manner there comes a time there comes a time when God says I'm not going to work another miracle in Bethsaida I'll heal you but I won't heal you here I'll deliver you, but I won't deliver you here. I'll raise you up, but don't you go back into that city and tell them because I've done enough for them. Somebody ought to shout something. Even, even when the worst things in life can happen, some of us have been saved too long to behave like rookies. I was never more proud of Brother Julio than I was at his daughter's home going. I looked at him when he finished. I said, that young man, he's got it. His daughter murdered. His little girl gone. His grandbaby fighting to live. Asked him to have words. Walked up with his Bible in his hand back straight and challenge every preacher in the place to stand. The clergy stood and began to say, he said, please remain standing. And then began to declare the counsel of the almighty God and challenged men to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that these gangs, this violence can be broken. And he spoke with power and authority and then went and took his seat. I said, now there's a man who's behaving like he's been taught something. He's acting like he's seen the Lord move in difficult situations before. Let me tell you something, Bethsaida's. We have seen God move in a way where we ought to behave a little differently. We know he's a healer. 
And then when he chooses not to heal, he's still God. When he chooses not to answer the way we want him to answer, he's still God. He's, he's been too good for, to us for us to stick out our lips or, or to fail to lift our hands or to call ourselves upset with God. No, the Lord is good and worthy to be praised. And I don't want the Lord to not want to work a single another miracle to get me to believe because God says, God says, there's no point in me doing it. There's no point in me doing it. There's no point in me doing it because he won't believe. Well, how do you know he won't believe? How you, because of what I've already done. Jesus said, this city won't believe. I don't, even, I don't even want them to know about it. I'm going to heal you, but I don't want you to tell them. And whatever you do, don't you take your sighted self back into that city. Don't you testify, not, not to them, because it's a waste of time. People don't like this kind of preaching, but the preacher got to know that there's a difference between the weak and the willful. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I remember a preacher. He's dead now. He's gone. But in his church, in his church, he pastored a church where the men came to his church in drag. He didn't preach against it. He didn't cry out loud against it. They were welcome. And that same preacher came to me uh, and asked me, he was pastoring in Atlanta, asked me if I would preach his men's conference. I wouldn't waste my time. There's no point in going there. Praise the Lord, because they don't want the gospel. Because if they wanted the gospel, they wouldn't be there. How do you know maybe the Lord would have had one? That was Bethsaida. There was no point. You got to know when the Holy Ghost is saying, stand down. Because when people make a decision that they're just not going to believe, I had the Lord say, shake the dust off your feet and go on to the next city. Jesus said, I'm not going to work another miracle in that city. So now if you want to be healed, you better come with me. You, 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 and I'll heal you, but, I, but I, got, I, got to, I got to at least go outside the city limits. I got to go outside the city limits. I can heal you, but I'm not healing you within the city limits of Bethsaida proper. So they go outside of town and then to show them that it's not for them to tell Jesus how to heal. You don't dictate the method. Jesus says, I'm going to do something that ain't nobody asked me to do. What, what am I going to do? I'm going to spit in his face. Did, nobody said spit on him, Lord. Nobody said spit on him, Lord. Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to use an unconventional method because I'm not going to let you tie me up in a box. Some of us think we got God all figured out. Some of us think we can control God, but I'm here to tell you, ain't nobody God, but the God of the Bible, and he is in charge. And right when you think God's gonna move one way, he'll move another way, just to show us that he's the almighty, all wise, all knowing God. And I wanna challenge somebody today, who's been waiting for him and you can't see your way. I want to challenge you to praise him because he's got you just where he wants you. When he gets ready for you to see your way, he'll show you the way. But in the meantime, give him glory. Tell him yes. Ah, yeah. Didn't nobody say spit on him, but Jesus spit on him. He spit on him. Can I get a witness? He spit on his eyes. Hallelujah. He says, I'm coming with an unconventional method. And the man was not appalled because in New Testament times, spit was considered to have medicinal properties. So when he spit on him, it was like applying medicine to the man. Thank you, Jesus. This is why today somebody ought to come to the Lord and tell him any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. However you choose to do it, I'll just let you have your way. After he spit on him, then the Bible said, and he laid his hands on him. 
spit on him first, then laid his hands on him. And after he touched him, he looked at the man and said, I got a question for you. Can you see anything? And the man said, yes, I can see. But I see men walking as trees. There's something here that I got to, I got to tell you about. This tells me that this man was not suffering from congenial blindness because if he was born blind, then he wouldn't have known what a tree looks like and he wouldn't have known what a man looks like. But the fact that he knew that he wasn't seeing clearly, he said, Lord, yes, I can see, but I can't see clearly. Now right there, right there, a praise ought to go in there because I guarantee you if there was somebody here who was paralyzed and we prayed for them and they got up and they took two steps or three steps and then had to get back in the chair, everybody would shout because two steps or three steps are better than no steps. That's a sign that a healing is taking place. That's a sign that God is moving by his spirit. Do I have anybody here who will praise God even though you see me as trees? Hallelujah. Praise him because you can see something. Yeah. Good God Almighty. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, praise the Lord, because you can see something. You may not see it all, but you can see that the Lord, ah, the Lord is moving by his spirit. so good you're gooder than good I got to come up with something else I'm going to find me another word these are smart people in here get, get a thesaurus don't do it now but I need stronger words than good because really 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 Jesus really Jesus Jesus could have walked away right there why because the healing process had already begun. You saw me a few Sundays ago when my knee went out preaching. Good God Almighty, knee locked up, couldn't hardly stand, leaning on the podium. But the next Sunday, I could go a little further. One Sunday, I didn't even want to come down. But there the saints were, they needed prayer. It was excruciating to step from here down there. But I made it anyhow, hallelujah. But I noticed one Sunday I could do this and I felt very little pain. Other words, the healing was on its way. Jesus could have waited and just let the man get better and better and better because the healing had already started. The process was not over. You ought to tell somebody, I'm in a process. The process wasn't over. But Jesus decided to break up the process. He said, I'm just going to go on and touch you again. He touched him again and he sped up the process and he healed that man's eyes. Ain't the Lord good? Ain't the Lord good? Somebody, anybody, everybody, praise him because the Lord will speed up the process. 
him the second time not because it was necessary for to go from blindness to seeing men like trees is huge improvement ask any athlete on the road on the road to recovery you recover in stages am I right about it the Achilles doesn't just heal overnight that blown shoulder don't heal overnight. You recover in stages. He was on his way. Jesus just decided, you know what? He touched him again. And the thing was complete. He was, he was restored. And he saw clearly. Wherever you are today, you're on your way. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, wherever you are, you're on your way. You just got to trust God. You just got to trust him. He'll, he'll dictate the method. He dictates the course. Amen. That's why I told you, spent time. I know you're wondering why you're spending so much time on and share recover. Well, some of you, some of us, when the Lord heals us, he lets us go through a recovery. Some of us, uh, it's instantaneous. God have healed me instantaneously many times. And then there are other times when I had to preach through it, limp through it, recover. Back at the, back, I'm so glad to be back at the, uh, at, at the clinic. Man, I, oh, Amen. up there working yesterday, my, my knee didn't even bother me. I felt so good. I went home and washed two, two cars, got in the backyard and, Worked out before I went to the clinic. Wash the car. I felt so good to be feeling good. And, and back on back on the road, road to recovery. God knows how to, to recover you. But during my recovery, I didn't I didn't I didn't withhold my praise. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I didn't I didn't backslide. I didn't hand my responsibilities over to another. I waited on the Lord. Wait on the Lord means to keep serving in the meantime. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he will strengthen thine heart. Cousin, with what you're going through with your daughter, you're waiting on the Lord. God's taking her through great sickness. I haven't mentioned it publicly because I don't know, you know, when you don't have permission. But the Lord is raising her up. He's a mighty God. He's a mighty God. And today, somebody is here today to say, Lord, I need you to touch me again. I know you're able. I know you can. Hallelujah. And then there are those who are saying, Lord, you know what? <laughs> I learned something today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm on my way. Praise the Lord. And if the Lord touches you today and speeds it up, so be it. And if he doesn't, he's God. Hallelujah. And he's good. But wherever you are, you want prayer, run to the altar. I'm going to pray for you. And the Lord is going to do it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, I need you to do this for me, Lord. Do this for me. Come unto him as unto a faithful creator. See him touching my mother in, in stages. Sometimes God operates like that. Hallelujah. Sometimes it's that, it's that way. It's just that way. Hallelujah. 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 And you know what he won't do? He won't give you any explanation. He just said, trust me. Trust me. Well, Lord, it seemed like to me it's taking so long. God said, that's, that's, that's the way it seemed to you. But that ain't the way it seemed to me. And 
when I determine that it's too long, he says, I'll bring you out. Oh, Lord. Please, Lord. Touch me one more time. Do it again, Lord. Whatever method you choose. I don't want to, God, I'm not going to tie your hands. However you choose to do this, Lord. However you choose to do it. And when you choose. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm going to trust you. Hallelujah. We know what happened to the man when the people of Bethsaida didn't get the word because from what's implied in the text, the man went left. I wouldn't have went back and told him. I've been scared while I'm telling him I lost my sight again. <laughs> they had to run up, roll up on me and see me somewhere. Are you that guy? Well, I can't deny that, yeah. But why didn't you come back and tell Because Jesus told me not to. Everything the Lord does for you is not for you to tell. Amen. And then he chooses who you tell. Because some people, their heart is so hard if you tell them, it won't move them nowhere. You, you, you ever went, ever, ever had God do something for you and you went and told someone and it robbed you of your joy? Their response took your joy from you. You expected them to be happy for you. How did it go up there? Hallelujah. You expected them to be happy for you, but they were so unhappy at what the Lord did for you. You hated that you told them. And then you went and found someone who knew how to rejoice with you. And the Holy Ghost told you when you were telling them. Before you told them, don't tell them. No, I just got to tell them. Don't tell them. Now nah, you don't have any joy. What a mighty God we serve. Dear Lord, we come to the altar. We come before you right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we, we've learned some things today. Your word is right. You're God and we're not. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. You are a great healer. You are the healer. You are the master. Hallelujah. You're the master. We come to put our faith in the master. In the master. In the master. Whatever the effort, whatever the, the, the method, we put our faith in the master. Master heal. Master deliver. Oh, great master. Whatever you choose to do, we're going to wait on you, Lord. We're going to praise you, Lord. Every step of the way, every step of the way, with our healing, with our deliverance, with our maturity, with our growth, hallelujah, with our advancements, our achievements, whatever you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise for it right now. And we give you glory for where we are in you. And Jesus, we just put faith in you. We put our trust in you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Heal. Heal me instantly. Heal. Let me recover. However you choose to do it. However, Lord, we'll just praise you anyhow. We'll give you glory anyhow because we know you know what you're doing. You're a mighty God. You're a true God and the everlasting King. And we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you glory. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on on the altar. On the altar. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's moving at his own pace. He's moving by his spirit. He's doing it right now. Doors are opening. Sickness is drying up. Diseases are drying up. Healings are taking place 
yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We thank you for every bit, every little bit, every little bit. Thank you. Thank you. I may not have 2020 vision, but I thank you for the vision I have. I may not be able to run like a triathlete, but I thank you for the steps I take. I may not be able to preach like Paul, but I thank you for what you bless me to do. I may not be able to have money like someone else, but I thank you for what I have. Jesus, 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 we give you glory. We give you praise. Yeah! For the next few seconds on the altar, praise him. Give him go. Receive from him. 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 Don't tell him how to do it. Just let him do it. Don't tell him how to do it. Let him 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 do it. Let him, let him. This thing is not about me. It's about him. Let him do it. Glory to God. Glory to God. God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I believe you today. I believe you today. I've seen you heal before. I've seen you deliver before. I've seen you work miracles before. I've seen you answer prayer before. Oh! oh I've seen you do it. Oh, I've seen you do it. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the next few days, those who are waiting on the Lord, everybody won't do this, but those of, of whom the Lord have impressed it upon will do it. People ask you, how, how are you doing? You'll say to them, the Lord is making it happen for me. It's happening. What's happening? What I've been waiting for. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Everybody won't, won't, won't remember that. And don't worry if you don't. But for those to whom the Lord will just put it in your spirit. You may even, even remind me. I mean, hey, how you doing? Pastor, it's happening for me. It's happening. It's happening. The processes have already started. See, Jesus could have left that man like he was. Because he would have he only gotten better. Because, man, it's a long way from seeing nothing to seeing men unclear. 
Are you blind, you take that. What? One man complained one day for he lost his shoes. He kept complaining until he saw a man who had no feet. He stopped complaining. Lift your hands and just praise him. I'm through. I've said all that the Lord would have me to say. I've preached all that he would have me to preach today. Hallelujah. I've given you the word of the Lord. I've given you something to believe, something to hold.